works package okay. and this uh, is done only once you don't need to repeat this you do it once and then uh, the next time around your package will be automatically launched so EMS once this is checked uh, EMS will add this menu inside uh, SolidWorks and it will also add this uh, ribbon bar here of icons that you can use uh, additionally it will add this third this this uh, this tab that you see here in the uh, in the feature management uh, in SolidWorks, so this would be your SolidWorks typical SolidWorks uh, uh, feature tree manager, and this is the EMS uh, manager where we would do the uh, the analysis and simulation of various uh, uh, models and, and devices. Now, uh, like I said earlier, EMS is one of our two packages. It is the package that's targeted for low frequency application, which means we can do static, anything that doesn't move, either electric static or magnetic static, uh, up to few kilohertz of frequency, uh, maybe up to a few megahertz in certain cases. Uh, when the frequency starts to be larger and the devices start to become electrically big, uh, we have a second package called HF Works for high frequency. And that's where we do uh, distributed circuit analysis or distributed structures uh, inside SolidWorks. It, again, both uh, products are gold certified, meaning that before you, uh, we release the packages, they go through a thorough evaluation from SolidWorks to ensure that we, uh, we, are, uh, we conform to all their rules, their user interfaces, and so on, so that the user has the same experience. The, the EMS should not stand out as a different package or require substantially different user interface. All right, so uh, the purpose of today's uh, webinar is not to give you, a, a, you know, a, a, an overview of everything that EMS can do. It's rather focused on one aspect, and this aspect is high voltage applications and uh, uh, things related to that. Uh, so I'll be sh I will be focusing on some uh, typical examples. Uh, we know high voltage applications can uh, can be of interest to a wide range of of, of users uh, and hopefully with uh, today's uh, demo I will touch upon a uh, few typical applications so that you can see how uh, EMS can address the design needs in this space. The starting point of any simulation in, in EMS is to have a, a model built and the model in this case would be inside uh, SolidWorks so you need to get your CAD model completed inside, work, inside SolidWorks. <coughs> Excuse me or inside Inventor if it's an Inventor uh, platform uh, before you switch over to, uh, to EMS. Now, in this case, for example, that's the name of my assembly. I have a couple of other different assemblies that show you uh, uh, real-world uh, applications. So in this case, for example, my assembly is called the spark plug. It's a real spark plug, as you can see. The, uh, the assembly has a number of different parts, different materials, and so on and so forth. Uh, I have another example, hopefully I'll also be uh, sharing with you, is a cable, a three-wire cable for high-power cable applications and so on. So I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, switching around through these uh, three examples to illustrate how it is that we can uh, use EMS to get some, some work done, some analysis, and some simulation results and so on. All right. So uh, let me just go off here and hide this. So this would be, for example, if this is a, co a, a three a three wire cable, a high voltage cable, and you wanted to see uh, what is the uh, what is the power handling of this cable and so on. So the key to the high voltage applications is typically the breakdown fields in various materials. So when you're designing, you want to avoid. If it is to avoid high uh, uh, breakdown, then you need to be uh, below the breakdown field values. If in the case of a spark plug, you want to get uh, arcing and you want to get corona, you want to get a discharge, then you want to be above the, at or above the, the field, the breakdown field intensity. So the name of the game is really to find the field intensity, uh, the electric field intensity. Notice that it's not necessarily just a voltage issue. 
because voltage by itself uh, is not enough to determine whether breakdown is going to happen or not. It's the geometry that plays as well. And so when you combine voltage and geometry, uh, you get electric field, and the intensity of the electric field uh, is, is uh, the intensity of electric field, which we'll measure in volts per meter, as opposed to straight volts, uh, the voltage that we apply, which would be just in volts. Uh, that is the quantity of interest if you want to determine if there is going to be arcing, corona, or any of these effects. All right, so uh, let's suppose that we have uh, managed to build uh, a model, in this case, of just a section of, a, of, a, uh, of, a, of this cable. Uh, I made a small section of it, my three conducting wires and the surrounding dielectric. So what happens when you're ready to go on and do simulations? You switch over to the EMS tab. You right-click on your uh, assembly name and you say create study. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, EMS is, does a lot of things. And one of the modules, the module you, have to, you actually need for high voltage applications is going to be the electrostatic model uh, because we'd be applying static voltages. Uh, additionally, uh, you can see the, the additional uh, solvers. Those are uh, basically very quickly magnetostatics to do static magnetics, either direct current or permanent magnets. Uh, conduction problems are uh, any uh, configuration of wires or resistors or whatever that you want to find current flow and uh, find the resistance in there. So those are electric conduction problem. AC magnetic and when you start to have alternating uh, alternating currents uh, and or and or moving uh, magnets and transient is basically the ability to uh, to drive uh, coils and circuits with with either AC voltage or uh, or transient voltage or transient current. Uh, so those are uh, uh, the various packages. Altogether, this is a complete package for uh, all kinds of uh, 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 low frequency, electromechanical, electric machinery of any type. We believe we can, you know, we can cover this in, inside the solid, uh, inside the EMS. Uh, uh, when you define a study, you can give it a name. Obviously, uh, by default, it's going to increment that study count. Uh, you can also control, in this case, the, uh, the, the type of solver you use. We have different solver technologies to, uh, you know, to, for, to take advantage of the, uh, the computer resources that would be available uh, to a user. So typically, if you have a multi-core uh, platform, you can do iterative solver that will do, take advantage of the, uh, the uh, uh, processors available and so on. We are also have an ability to control the, uh, the, uh, the precision of the solution and maybe touch upon one of this uh, later on. It basically relates to the meshing and what kind of uh, uh, number of unknowns that we, uh, we would associate with uh, each mesh element. Uh, the additional two options are uh, parameterization and uh, computing capacitance. So for uh, static electricity, Whenever you have voltages between conductors and so on, or you have a, a configuration of conductors, we have capacitances uh, between mutual capacitance, self-capacitances, and so on. So if you wanted to compute the capacitance, you need to ask the solver to do the compute capacitance, and, uh, you know, and then uh, the software will take care of that. Okay. Uh, you you notice here that if you need to do capacitance calculations, there is specific boundary conditions you need to use. So I'm for the time being, I'm going to just skip this uh, and basically stick with, with the default uh, default configuration. Uh, the last uh, the final thing I wanted to mention is the uh, motion coupling capability. Uh, for those of you who ha have SolidWorks Premium, you know that SolidWorks Premium comes with a motion simulator. So if you wanted to find electric, electrostatic forces and how uh, compute how those forces move your parts, uh, you can do that. So you can do motion coupling uh, if need be. All right. So let's say for the sake of, uh, of arguments uh, that uh, we wanted to uh, analyze this just a standard uh, standard application, you know, high voltage application here. Uh, so I would uh, tick off check. And you notice here my study is created. Uh, the studies in EMS uh, and in, in our package generally have a, have a standardized configuration. 
there are uh, essentially three or four main steps that you need to uh, perform before you can get results. Uh, you need to define materials, you need to define loads and restraints, or sometimes we call them boundary conditions. If you need to compute forces and torques, you need to tell it uh, where, on which bodies you want to compute the forces or torques. And obviously, this, this package is based on the finite element technique, so finite element requires a mesh, so you need to have a mesh. You could create a mesh uh, by yourself and control the, its creation, or uh, you can just have the software uh, do the mesh automatically when you click run to get results. All right, so very briefly, uh, how do we go about uh, applying materials? So uh, any, any, any uh, part in the assembly could be assembly of bodies, so you could apply to uh, individual bodies, or you can apply to all bodies under a part. Uh, if you, so in this case, for example, this is my air, uh, air part, so I can just go ahead and say apply materi material to all, and I select air, and then these are the air properties, and I'm fine with that. So you notice that the part that uh, has a material defined gets a check mark. Um, you can go through these parts, doing them one by one. Let's say, for the sake of argument, this part has the same material. You can just drag and drop it, and you can go through this process. Uh, alternatively, if I already had done uh, a study, like in this case, I already solved this problem earlier. So I know the materials, so I can just drag the materials between studies if I already defined them. So like in this case, uh, when you hover over the body, it will tell you that this is an E3 material, and it's showing you that it has zero conductivity, so this is essentially an insulator, and it's non-permanent uh, non magnet. Okay. Uh, you can at any given time edit material and check what it is that the material property is. Okay. Uh, Let's say in this case I wanted to define a material and I want to show you something else you can do here. And this is uh, EMS has an extensive material library of different kinds, insulators, conductors, uh, you know, uh, metals, permanent magnets, uh, uh, nonlinear materials that uh, have uh, behavior that changed with applied uh, fields and so on. But let's say for the sake of argument you don't have, and the material is not one of those that you have, you want to create your own material library. So you can go and place your material library. In this case, I'm going to put it on the desktop, and I'm going to call it my library. Okay. And once I have a library, then I can create materials. And this is a dialog box. You need to give it uh, a material type. Let's say this we're going to call group one. And uh, a material name. Okay. Mat one. And then we can give it the relative permittivity that you want. I don't know, let's say this is 2.35, something like that. And you can control all of the material properties. Uh, basically, if you're creating this for static, then you typically you're either doing dealing with conductors or uh, insulators. If you're doing magnetic materials, then you can uh, specify the uh, magnetization parameters and polarization and so on. And the other thing I also I forgot to mention is the coupling to thermal. So uh, we can also uh, do coupling to thermal in various solvers. Uh, in, in exostatic, we don't because obviously we don't have current uh, moving charges, so we don't have heat generation. But all other uh, all other solvers have the coupling to thermal, so you would specify thermal properties. In this case, thermal conductivity of your material. So this is the way you would do it, and then once you have a material, you can apply your own material. Okay, I say yes, save changes, and that material is my mat one. So you can build your own material library and use it if the materials are not already defined. That way you don't have to, uh, if you use a material frequently, but it's not in the library, you can have it in your own library. So uh, by combination of these uh, techniques, you can do material definition. Uh, quickly, so here I show you on top that all these materials have been defined. So this one, okay, so this is a uh, uh, one of the cables. This is the second cable, and this is the third cable. All three are copper, and these are the insulators. I have ring insulators around. Okay, each each of these uh, of these uh, wires of these <coughs> cables there, and uh, all of them 
are basically homogeneous. So these are the 3.3 dielectric constant material. So once you've finished the material uh, part, you, you get a check on your materials uh, uh, folder there. Next, we need to define boundary conditions. So this is a high frequency, uh, uh, sorry, this is a high voltage application. Uh, so what we would need to do is we want to define voltages, a configuration of voltages on our three on our three conductors. So I have the copper one, copper three, copper. Okay. So the way you would go about it is you're going to go to uh, loads and uh, restraints. And by the way, you can have uh, different types of of boundary conditions. So one mode is to say I want to apply a certain voltage level. And this we need for high voltage application. We can put the voltage that we want. You can say we want, to, we want these to do, be floating conductors, and that is what you would need to use if you wanted to compute the capacitance. You could alternatively say I want some charge density or total charge in a given uh, body in the structure. So any of these you can do. So in this case, we want to basically go and say, OK, fine. We want to apply uh, voltages. And you can apply voltages to uh, faces or bodies. So these are faces and these are bodies. So in this case, I am already selecting uh, this this conductor here, or I could just maybe just uh, can clear the selection. So if I wanted this one to be, let's say, at uh, minus five minus, let's say, I want to put minus five thousand volts there. Okay. When I say check, it applies. Okay. Uh, I can say sh show preview on the so the next guy here. I want on this one. That's my uh, second conductor. I also want this one to be at minus five thousand. Okay. And then my third conductor. Okay. I want this one to be at let's say ten thousand. Okay, so you notice here I have my three voltages. Okay, so I can hide this. Okay, I can at any given time show to preview, identify the voltage. That's my voltage, my first line. And again, when once you hover, <coughs> if you hover over your over your three, you should get the voltage value that you selected there. So I'm going to hide this one again. So it's actually it's, this is high. So these are my three volts. So this is the way you go about setting the voltage values that you need. I'm not going to compute any forces and torques. Let me show you quickly how the meshing is done. Uh, okay. Uh, first, I want to show you uh, the way we control meshing. The way we control meshing is through this uh, feature called Apply Mesh Controls. Uh, essentially, what we do when we mesh, we have a global element size. And wherever we want the element size to be different, we want it to control it, smaller or larger, we apply a mesh control. So in this case, uh, we would need to control the mesh close to conductors. Now, if you, uh, if you guys uh, revert back to uh, whatever courses you take in, in electrostatics or whatever, you know that the, the static electric field uh, next to a conductor decreases uh, essentially as 1 over R squared, so the field is going to vary very rapidly. Okay, The field is going to have very rapid variation close to conductors. So to capture that variation, it's important to know how to mesh. So you need to control the meshing close to the conductor. So in this case, uh, we have, uh, remember we have these rings around the conductors. We put these in on purpose so that we can control the meshing. We have a very fine mesh there. And uh, coarser mesh away. Uh, if you make the, the mesh very fine all over, you end up with a very big problem and you don't need necessarily the mesh to be fine away from the uh, conductor dielectric interface. That's, that's not critical. The critical part is the, at the interface between the conductor and the dielectric. So here is typically what you say if you wanted to apply mesh control to this, to this part here or this we can apply mesh control to faces or bodies. So if I want to apply to this, uh, this body, the entire body, okay, I can uh, clear the selection here. So this body, I want the element size there instead of being three millimeter, 
I know that this ring is about 2 millimeters big, maybe I want this to be 0.25. Okay, so I want to have 8 elements in that section. Okay, so you see I have a mesh control there. Okay, I could, I could do the same thing for the other part, so I can actually go and say, okay, I want to do a, another mesh control, and I can select this body and this body, both of them, and again say these are 0.25. Now I have my mesh controls done, the next thing is to create the mesh, and in the meshing uh, you have the global element size, the tolerance, tolerance tells the measure if you have uh, two points that are less than the tolerance away to merge them, to have a good mesh, and we have a third parameter which is the number of elements per diagonal, this ensures that you have a good meshing on all parts and a good transition mesh from different uh, part sizes, so we have a feature size that's very small and a feature size that's very big, you get a good transition mesh from one to the other. So I'm not going to mesh this, I can Muted. what the mesh looks like, so I can say just show mesh, and we were looking at this earlier, remember these are my, my conductors, my three conductors, that's the interface uh, close to the conductor, between the conductors and dielectrics, and uh, Okay, is there, uh, there is a, a question just came along, is there a, a rule of thumb for, uh, for, the, the, for the mesh size uh, selection? Uh, the, because of static, these are static fields, so there is no concept of frequency or anything like that. I think the, the rule of thumb is typically that you want to have, uh, uh, essentially you have enough elements to capture to capture 1 over r squared variation. Okay. So on a structure like this, uh, basically I would say if your structure is in the order like I, I said, said earlier, so if this is about 2 millimeters, uh, you want to be probably around a fraction of a millimeter uh, size close to the conductor, away from the conductor it is, uh, it is not as critical. And I will show you this through the results that we have obtained with this mesh. So again, so this mesh is a, is a, is a mesh that was automatically created by, by the software. Uh, aside from you telling it that I wanted to control uh, the meshing at some points, uh, everything else is, is automated. Uh, okay. so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so once again, because we expect the field variation to be rapid between the conductor and the dielectric, that's why we refine the mesh around those areas. Okay. Uh, and maybe to uh, go back to the question that was asked earlier, the current version of EMS, uh, the actually I should say the, the, the next release hopefully of EMS will incorporate some uh, adaptive meshing, so you would not even need to worry whether your uh, mesh size is good enough, the solver will, uh, will calculate and will estimate the error and decide that uh, if the mesh is good enough, it's fine, if not, it will refine where it needs to refine. So uh, that, that issue will be alleviated uh, uh, in the near future. Okay, so uh, very rapidly, so those are the, the key steps. We have materials, we have boundary conditions or loads and restraints, we have a mesh. Once we reach that, then we are ready to go. The next step would be to yeah, click, click run. Okay. Now I showed you this, this sequence uh, of, of, of setting up study. We went through materials, boundary conditions or mesh. You don't have to do it in that particular order. You can just start with your any one of them, and, uh, but before you run, the three of them at least or, uh, uh, should be there. If, if you make the two first steps, if you define materials and boundary conditions and you say run, the software will figure that there is no mesh and it will mesh using default settings. Okay. And, uh, okay, and then you will be ready to solve. So the solving process is, is relatively fast. Uh, in, for these types of structures, okay, I have uh, uh, so uh, let me so so this is a study that was completed and solved. This is a study that we basically were using to illustrate how we set up. Okay, so note the difference between the two. Uh, the difference is basically that we have these two additional folders here: the results folder and the log file. 
which tells us that uh, there, there is a, the, uh, the study has been executed, has been uh, simulated, and the log file will give you uh, the log uh, of the execution, if there are any errors or warnings or uh, any of those things. The results folder is uh, where all the results are uh, accumulated or stored. So let's go quickly through the results and see what kind of results we have. Now we, we split the results in, uh, in two different types. We have what we call tabular results. Those are lumped quantities. In this case, we probably just have the energy stored in the system. Okay, so if you click on the results table, you get the level of energy that's stored in the system for that section or the small section of, of cable. The other results are uh, plot results, field or distributed results. So what we have, we have the electric field. We have also the displacement field, uh, that's the E field, that's the D field. We have the potential distribution and the force density, uh, the electrics, the electrostatic force density distribution. So if you wanted to or look at any of these quantities, you can just go ahead and create plots. Okay, so I'll show you briefly how we do this. The software by default will create one plot for each in each of these folders but you can create and change the plots at will, any which way that suits you. Now, in plotting field quantities, we have two types. We have the 3D types and the 2D types. Now, 3D types, I'll cover this first, and then we'll come back to the 2D types. So, if you want to do 3D, okay, you need first to, you can give a, 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 a name to your plot, uh, and you can choose which field components you're looking at. So, in this case, we're looking at the resultant electric field, uh, we'll look at it in volts per meter, because we want to uh, look at the, uh, the scale, the plot scale, we want to see those displayed in volts per meter. You could, you could uh, alternatively switch it to volts per centimeter or per inch. Uh, you, have, uh, you can do a fringe type plot or a vector type plot. So in this case, uh, by default, I'm going to do a fringe plot. And then you can have either the plotting at discrete uh, or, or contour lines or points. So we'll take the continuous by default, and when I check OK, then I get my field plot. Okay. So you see my three conductors. The solution, the electric field generated by my configuration of voltages is here. And this is my, so this is my uh, scale that's telling me what is the color coding here. Uh, red is the highest, so I have about 3.5, 10 to the 6 volts per meter. So that is slightly larger than the breakdown voltage in air, which is three, around 3, 10 to the 6, and 0 uh, uh, elsewhere. Okay. So, all right. This is a, a, another feature that you can use. If you wanted to locate the maximum and the minimum of your mo in your model, you would go in the, under the right click, select the chart options, and you take these two, uh, these two uh, check marks here, uh, show minimum annotation, show maximum, it will show, uh, show them to you. So we know that the maximum electric field, as expected, is around this. This, this, this conductor is at 10,000 volts. And this is my maximum field that I'm finding here. All right. Uh, okay. So let me turn these off. Okay. So that's one way to look at the data. Another way to look at the data, once you have a plot, I can go and make this into section clipping. So I can make this into sections. Uh, so a section plot would look something like this. Okay. So I have a section. So I'm looking at the section, just a slice inside the model. Now this is a uniform model in the third direction, so it doesn't change much. Okay. Okay. Uh, I could also have vector plots. So if I show you the vector, so you can see the where the field is uh, is leaving from where and landing where. And you notice the field is purely normal, as expected on the conductors. Okay. And this is a, a kind of a symmetric distribution, the two conductor at minus 5,000 and one at 10,000. Uh, you could alternatively uh, look at isosurfaces. Where is the field, uh, where does the field have a specific isosurface value? And you can at any given point, uh, uh, you know, change. Let's see here. Um, 
select options. Okay. Oh. Yeah, we can change the, I wanted to, the, the ISO clipping. So I can actually, here I can see that I have two ISO surfaces. If I want to change the values of the ISO surfaces, then I want to look at higher values or lower values. Okay. Uh, depending on what it is that I'm looking for, which 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 uh, intensity, which electric field intensity I'm looking at, so you can do this. You can add other surfaces uh, at will, basically. So you can place more surfaces. You can go up to six of these surfaces. So really, uh, the post processing in the in the uh, distribute or the 3D sense gives you a lot of a lot of capabilities. Uh, if again, I, I just show the the section plot again. Uh, if I were to uh, go into section clipping, I can I could also do more than one section at a time. So I can have two of these sections, one in one plane, one in another. I can go uh, and add third section and so on and so forth. So, so you can go this, you can do this. Uh, you know, uh, you can have as many plots as you want in the uh, the combination of sections, vectors, or whatever. So that covers the the three D plotting. Uh, capabilities uh, and that 3D is useful and so on but sometimes you you actually want to see uh, more specific numbers and you're more interested along a specific path and this uh, when I switch to the second example I think uh, this is typically what what some of the standards or some some of the benchmarks uh, require they require you to know field values at a specific point so in this case what we would do is we would do what we call 2D, 2D, 2D field plots, okay? And uh, to do this, you would, uh, you would pick points in the model, say, I want it from this point to this point, I wanted the field plot between these two, okay? And you can add even a, a third point, and it's going to go basically around these three, it makes three straight lines, one like this, one like that, and interpolate the mesh data, the results inside the mesh, and generate a 2D plot for us. Okay? So uh, let me show you what a 2D plot looks like in this case. So we have uh, the field values that are zero inside the conductor, between the conductors, and zero again inside the second conductor. And we see uh, this is a way to actually go, and you can at any given point look what your you know data is. You can also look at this in a listing format and look at your data values at any given point. So if you're clicking, as you're clicking, you're actually seeing you know, this point here is is there in the table and so on. So you can actually uh, do quite a bit with with the 2D plotting and look closely at the field values, particularly as you're interested in in breakdown field values. Where do they occur? So you could be uh, can do that very precisely with the 2D uh, field plotting. Okay, uh, so so again, now uh, you can do this to any of these uh, any of these qualities. So we have most of these are electric field. I can do something similar with the potential. So let me show you what the potential uh, looks like. So this is my potential distribution. Uh, so I can actually do this into maybe a the definition, uh, so I make this into lines. Okay, I can choose 40 lines, and I say, well, okay. So you can look at this, and you can see your your, your contour lines, and you can make into the even this contour line. You can section it and look at it at at a given plane, and you can move your uh, your plane. Okay. And then you just you can just put section only here, so you can just see this as as one section. So you can look, you can uh, thoroughly examine your results uh, throughout your 3D model using uh, all of these tools in the post processing. This is a very powerful uh, post processing features that we have. Okay, uh, so that basically uh, how we do how we do the uh, setup of a study, how we look for uh, results. Uh, let me just go back to maybe uh, very briefly to this, the isosurfaces. Obviously, if, if you're looking at breakdown field values, okay, and you wanna, uh, you wanna, you might wanna look uh, 
you might want to you might want to set the the ISO values to the field value of interest. So if, if your breakdown is going to happen at around three ten to the six, uh, so you want to put three ten to the six, and look where three ten to the six appears in your model, and that will tell you that uh, the breakdown is going to occur around that point, okay, or that number, uh, that surface, okay. Okay, so uh, so this basically uh, gives you very quickly, very briefly, how we set up uh, a study, uh, how we play with the results, and so on. Uh, once that is done, uh, you might want to do reports. You want to want to might want to document your work, and this is where the report uh, feature comes in. So uh, you can generate any number of reports, and the way this works, you go to reports, you right click you would do uh, create a report. Uh, the report basically uh, dialog box comes up. You by when you install the software, your logo file should be configured, logo of your company, uh, your name and so on and so forth, the date. And the report structure has all of these elements. So it has a cover page, an introduction, a description. If you want to keep a track of your file information, uh, model view, etc. Any of these items that you don't want to have, you can just exclude, okay? And once you're ready, uh, if you wanted to put in some, some initial words about your introduction, okay, this is uh, whatever, okay? Uh, once you're ready, then you choose the, uh, the format. Uh, you can also decide where you want to save this, so by default it's going to use the same direct to the same folder where you're working, but you can place it elsewhere if you needed to, and you can choose between HTML and Word format. So if you want to put, into, uh, put this into Word format, once you click OK, it will automatically capture uh, all your work and put it in a Word document for you. Okay, so it's going through this now. It should be completing soon. So it's completed and it generated this Word uh, report. So notice that this this report uh, is inside SolidWorks. So Word is inside SolidWorks, and the idea here is that we we want our users to be as productive as possible, and so switching windows and so on and so forth uh, is, is 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 not desirable in this case. So this is actually uh, the report. So as this is uh, this is. A, my introduction, and obviously that's not a very serious introduction, and I want to play with it and uh, you know color it or whatever. So you have the full uh, full capabilities of Word right there and there. Okay. Uh, if obviously if you wanted to save as PDF, you can ex make it into a PDF once you're done with that, and uh, you can share your document and so on. So this also tells you where your work is in case you look at this one day and you're looking where where. W w where everything is, okay, and this is the rest of your uh, report. So we, we wanted the model view; it's there uh, with the mesh and without the mesh. These are my materials, and so on. Uh, these are my boundary conditions. The voltages that I applied are there. I did not ask for any force or torque uh, calculation. It gives me information about uh, what was the number of elements that were used, and which solver I used, and so on and so forth the energy of the system that it computed, and these are my electric field results. So these are the results that uh, you saw earlier. Of course, this is, since this is Word, and this is where you might want to type stuff and edit and comment on these results and so on. You can also, of course, this is uh, Word, so you can crop this picture if you, if you wanted to, or you know, you can do, basically, you're in uh, full editing format inside Word, my ISO surfaces, my 2D plots, everything that I've done is captured. Uh, we'll go, this is my potential, I made it into, uh, into contour lines and so on. So this is basically uh, the reporting feature. Uh, once you're done, again, you can save it. And, okay. uh, you can also, one other feature, very, uh, you can, uh, another feature in the reporting section, you can import a document so you can import somebody else's file, your, co your colleague, your coworker is doing some work and you want to add simulation results 
and so this is let's say you can import the word document let's say this is actually my imported document and I wanted to add something at the end of this so the way you would do it you go into the results let's say I wanted to get this uh, you know maybe this electric field plot in particular I wanted to add it to to my report so just drag it and drop it into your study and it's right there so I added it at the end of this I can just you know click down and just you know, reduce it to size. So it's as easy as that. Of course, you can add your own comments and so on and so forth. All right. So, uh, so that gives you a, an idea how we get the study from start to end. Let's say you did this and you found that okay, uh, this 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 combination of conductors, voltages, and materials is going to cause corona, or is going to arc, or is going to uh, have a, a dielectric breakdown. I want to try it with another material or try to change something. So uh, the easiest way to do this, you drag your study, you drop it onto your assembly, and by default it's going to create a copy of it. The default name is copy of study one. Let's keep that for the sake of argument. So I have everything that I've done is, is captured and duplicated. And if I wanted now to go to this dielectric and say, no, this is not the dielectric I want. I want to edit this material. It's a different material, or go to the library and apply material from from the library. Pick something else, okay? Uh, some other material or whatever. So I can do that. So let's say I change that material, and I say okay. Now notice as soon as I change material, my results are invalidated. So this folder is grayed out, but I'm ready now to do a second study. So I don't have to change anything else. I can just run uh, click run study. And that's it. Okay, so if you wanted to do uh, play with material or different configurations of your studies, you could set them up ahead of time. So you can have four of these, for example, and you can come here and say run all studies. Once you have a number of studies, uh, so the software will then sequentially run them one by one, get all the results, and then you can also do compare studies between results. Okay, so that also another feature where you could use uh, you know the, your results and generate comparison tables between the different alternatives uh, one last thing with regard to this uh, uh, to this uh, multi multi design scenario capability is SOLIDWORKS has the multiple configuration option and this is uh, configurations driven by Excel uh, Excel uh, documents where any of the dimensions or any of the geometric relationships, matings or anything that's in your assembly that the geometric nature that you want to parameterize, you could uh, generate multi configurations inside SOLIDWORKS and work with those. Okay. All right, so uh, uh, please do not hesitate if you have questions, just type them in uh, at this point. I'm going to uh, switch over to uh, Second example, okay, and maybe. Huh? All right, so <clears throat> let me go over here and show you the spark plug example. And the idea here is that uh, really this is a real, real, uh, a real life problem. Okay, you do not, unlike other uh, packages, because we are embedded in SolidWorks, you really work with the product your final product. There are no simplifications. We don't need to import and export geometries and, and uh, try to heal geometries, fix things and so on. Uh, so you work with the real thing. Okay? So in this case we have a, a spark plug. This is a typical you know, uh, uh, electrostatic application. The idea here is we want to generate arcing but we don't have so much voltage as we did with, with the cable or whatever. So the gap becomes very important. So the closer these things come together, then even a slightly uh, a lower voltage can generate arcing and so on. So this is my assembly, as you can see. I made some parts transparent so that we can see inside. Okay, and this is my EMS study. Again, I just I'm not going to go through the steps that I explained. So uh, basically, we have some materials defined. So we have the air here, okay, and we have this is a contact part, and this is copper, and I have an electrode here. And this electrode has one body that's copper as well, so you can see it running through. So that's my my electrode. Uh, and uh, you know, 
uh, let's see here you can actually I don't know if you can just uh, I want to hide this part here and I you know maybe okay and so anyway so this is my my uh, my electrode that's there, I have a number of uh, some fillets here which are uh, fused silica, so this part here that's highlighted is, is the fused silica part, which typically that's the white part of your spark plug uh, in real life, uh, the ground strap is around there, and so on and so forth. So the, all of these, we define the real material, like in this case, this is a, 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 a ceramic part, it's BE ceramic as you can see, okay. Uh, with 90, 97% uh, beryllium oxide, I guess. So uh, there is an air part inside uh, that fills inside, there is a cavity inside, and there is a porcelain uh, as part of this. So this is really a complete uh, and real life model. You don't need to simplify it. All you need is just define material properties for these. In this case, what we have done is we apply the voltage uh, to, uh, to the, the, this center pin and uh, fixed voltage there, and this is basically an hour. Uh, so I can show you here what we have. On that face, we put a thousand volt, okay? And uh, on the second one, okay, we put that to ground, basically zero volt. Okay. So we wanted to see what kind of electric feed we're going to generate, given the gap, and given only a thousand volts, will this arc or not, okay? Uh, we created the mesh, obviously, I'm gonna, but let me just skip over straight and show you the electric field results that we got here. Because the gap is air, so uh, this one should, okay, running low on, my, on resources here. Okay. So as expected, I have the highest intensity, okay, zoom here. So this is yeah. Okay. So and, and I have electric field that is on the order of 2.45 10 to the 6. So this this configuration right now is not exactly sparking with that water. So we needed a little bit more to get this part to work. Okay? Or we could have played with the geometry. Again, one one feature we we could do in SolidWorks is play with make the gap a, a, a configurable parameter, okay, and, uh, and study the impact of the gap on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the dielectric or the air breakdown in this case, okay. Uh, you can also uh, play with, if you want to, let's say, to look at data over a specific part, in this case, that's my uh, inner air, and I want to look at the fields there, I can go and isolate that part, okay, and then I make a 3D plot, and when I plot the results, it's plotting the results only on my isolated part. Now I have, again, I showed you earlier, we start with this, with this plot, then we can make it into a section plot to go and see uh, inside, the, inside this, this part, and you see again where the field is concentrated it's in the gap region there, okay, and that's my ISO surface that I'm looking at the field values, okay. All right, so uh, the things that I talked about earlier apply equally here about reporting and all of that stuff, the multiple studies uh, and all of those things. So if we can go ahead and exit the, uh, the exit the, uh, okay, this isolation, so basically, uh, okay. Now this is uh, my third example and probably my most complicated one is a, is a real life example and this comes to us from, uh, from April and I'm going to make uh, uh, just a quick uh, uh, overview of this uh, April uh, standard model. So this is for April, which is the, uh, uh, the Electric Power Research Institute, uh, many of you work in the high voltage area know about this. This is a basically transmission lines for high voltage or high voltage transmission lines. It's very important that your insulators be able to handle okay, the requirements. So EPRI goes in to make sure that the simulation tools are accurate. They establish standard, they expect standard results. So we have a huge structure which is those, you know, uh, 
pylons that, 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 carry, that carry high voltage electricity with a multiple uh, meter structures, in, you know, uh, and they want to see the electric field very close to this insulator sheath. Okay? And in this case, uh, the benchmark is to find the electric field uh, uh, along this line, which is only one millimeter away from, uh, from this insulator. Additionally, they also would like to uh, compare the results inside the rod, okay, and that's another plot they, they ask for. So, there are benchmark results in the, any software that is, you know, that respects itself has to uh, produce uh, these results. So, this is basically the full complex configuration, as you can see, uh, the, the high voltage transmission line with height to ground and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, so, when we switch over to SOLIDWORKS, okay, so this is actually uh, uh, half of the model because uh, the, the challenge is uh, do we need to model the whole structure or not? And the answer is yes, we can model all of this in, in, in EMS, uh, it's just there is a price to pay when you make a very big structure, uh, in this case the mesh size because we have a big volume big volume of space uh, is, is, uh, is big. Uh, however, okay, so uh, we've done, we went ahead, what we've done, we just took half because there is symmetry, so we took advantage of symmetry, we, uh, and we went ahead and solved the problem according to the IPRI standard, and this is the, the field plot that we produced along the one millimeter, one millimeter away from the insulator. When, uh, but I think it's, uh, uh, let me see how, how, how much voltage was applied there. Uh, the definition, so that, that one was the grounded one. I think it's 80,000 volts. Yeah, 80,000 volts. So we have 80,000 volts. Okay, and the other one, one is at 80,000 volts, and the second one is at minus 40,000. Okay, and one is ground. So basically, uh, this result is uh, uh, compared directly to the IPRI uh, measurements, the IPRI standard, and these results are right on, they're dead on. Uh, it, was a, it is a challenging problem, obviously, and goes back to the, uh, to the concept that when you do electrostatic uh, simulations, when you have uh, conductors, charges on conductors, the field away from the conductor is going to decay rapidly, so you need to have a good mesh uh, close to the conductor, uh, and then the mesh can be coarser as you go away. So this result is basically uh, dead on with respect to, uh, to uh, the IPRI, and I can show you, I have uh, studied this result, uh, th this, uh, this configuration, let me just go ahead and hide this, okay, and I have a report here, and we have all the, the results of, of this study. Uh, so we isolated one section of it, and we can look at the results on the isolated part. Uh, and uh, so I can maybe scoop over and show the electric field, and it's highly concentrated in this uh, in this part of the of the structure, as as one might expect. And my one millimeter line is along, uh, as I showed you earlier, is very close to the structure and my electric field results are here. So you can see that it's pretty much, okay, uh, dead on. All right, so uh, I think I basically covered uh, quickly, I hope. Uh, uh, so uh, just one of the, one additional feature I can, uh, you know, show. Y again, you can work with real life complex problems, okay. But if we wanted, in this case, we are interested only in one part, and it's, it turns out that it's, the other structure has little or no influence on the results, so what you can do, you can actually go and exclude what we have, this feature, exclude from study, so you could be working with a very, very complex uh, structure, you don't need to make a huge mesh and a huge model that takes a lot of time to simulate, you exclude the parts that are not of interest, and you simulate the parts that you need only. And this is a very useful productive feature for users because that way uh, they can be working with the 
the real complete model, but focusing only on the section of interest when it comes down to, to uh, when it comes time to uh, to simulating and so on. Okay, uh, I think that basically uh, wraps my presentation. I think I will uh, probably hand it over to Adam and uh, both of us, and uh, we'll uh, we'll take any questions you guys might have. Well, thank you, Dr. Kuke, for your presentation, and um, the floor is open for any questions, gentlemen. So, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box, and Ms. Uh, Dr. Kuki will answer them. Okay, I see a question about application to MEMS. Okay. Uh, all right, so yes, for, for electrostatically activa activated MEMS, you can actually use this, uh, this solver to find the force. Uh, currently, we do not have uh, coupling to uh, uh, mechanical solving, but you can uh, export the data, the force data, and uh, inv import it possibly into some other uh, uh, mechanical simulator to find uh, deformation or find uh, the motion that would be generated by essentially deformation generated by the applied electrostatic force. Okay. Uh, we are hoping that in the near future, maybe not the upcoming of the release, but uh, soon after, we hope to have uh, Okay. We hope to have uh, coupling, mechanical, electromechanical coupling. So we do that coupling inside that. All right. Uh, uh, another question uh, comes. Okay. All right. So let's see here. All right. So. Uh, 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 there are a couple of questions here. Okay, let me take them one at a time. So, uh, number one, what was the spark plug expected uh, volt, volt per meter value that would allow arcing? Now, arcing will happen. Basically, what arcing is is a uh, the it's a it's a breakdown in the insulator. So, air is is an insulator uh, up until a certain uh, electric field value. Starting that electric field value and beyond air becomes a conductor and allows charges to move. Uh, the, th that is called the dielectric strength, typically, of, of an insulator. Uh, airs, the air uh, dielectric strength, the field value is about 2.9, uh, 10 to the 6, 3, 10 to the 6 volts per meter. Okay? And that is uh, at normal, you know, normal pressure, and uh, it, it varies with the humidity conditions, obviously, because it, uh, it affects the conductivity of air. But typically, that's the the number, and that is actually the number that hap That's what happens when you when you get the electrostatic discharge. You rub yourself against plastic, or you grab a doorknob, and you get shocked. That's basically what it is. You have enough charge on you, on your body, on your finger, and when you come close enough you get an electric field that exceeds 2.9 or 3 10 to the 6 volts per meter, you get arcing. Uh, so in, in for the spark plug, because it's going to ignite uh, a, a, a liquid, we would need to know, I do not know offhand what is the dielectric strength of, of gas, but to arc inside gas and get the gas going, you need to exceed that, uh, that value. Uh, I hope that answers that question. Uh, Okay, the next one is some guidelines to avoid breakdown. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, the, the, the guidelines to avoid breakdown. So, there are essentially, uh, again, uh, today's demo was really intended to give you, yeah, to give you a, uh, a quick overview of how the software works and so on, but uh, when we when we sell uh, the product, we also provide training and we go into more depth uh, to explain some of these notions and so on. So, uh, to avoid breakdown, uh, there are a couple of things you can play with. 
geometry plays a role. So whenever you have sharp edges, uh, that tends to concentrate charge and generate higher electric field and that will generate corona and arcing breakdown right there. So that is uh, the, fir the first thing to do is whatever, whenever you can avoid to have sharp edges. The second one is obviously materials and sometimes you don't have a choice there. Okay, so the material properties uh, sometimes are, uh, you know, if, if you have no choice and you have to go with certain material then your only leverage is geometry, uh, otherwise uh, you know, uh, materials sometimes if you can exchange, have a, a, a material with higher, uh, higher dielectric strength that will help to avoid discharge. The third, obviously, the discharge arrives if, if, if you have proximity of, of metals, of conductors, if you can, uh, if it is feasible and uh, it will not affect your design, uh, increasing distance between conductors uh, reduces the chances of, of, of dielectric breakdown in the arcing. So that is uh, a third option to, to consider, okay? Yeah. So, so that basically yeah, comes down to the, the level of thickness of your of insulator. So if you can distance your uh, conductors further, so you have a thicker insulator, thicker insulating layer, or a, a bigger insulating volume, uh, then that basically uh, will help reduce the chances of, of dielectric breakdown. Yeah. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Any uh, any other questions? Okay, so if there is no more questions, and if you guys think of any questions after uh, this webinar ends, feel free to send your questions to support uh, at uh, emworks.com. Support at emworks.com. We will answer them via email. And for any sales uh, uh, sales related questions, please uh, you can send them to sales. Uh, is uh, one more question say say there can you export data have you seen that uh, dr cookie yes okay yeah so. absolutely okay uh, you can export data and uh, as i mentioned earlier for example for the uh, force density uh, calculation if you wanted to do electromechanical coupling but you will also export electric field data uh, potential data uh, any of the results that, that, that we show, you can export. Uh, another question, okay, so it's a good question because, uh, you know, we, we talked today about the SOLIDWORKS platform. Uh, not everybody necessarily uses SOLIDWORKS. Uh, to get their model done, maybe you have somebody in your company doing the work for you and they're using another CAD. So can you import uh, uh, models into uh, EMS? And the answer is yes, and this is where we rely on, on the capabilities, the CAD capabilities, geometry capabilities of SOLIDWORKS. So if you, if you wanted to import something, you'd go into open. Uh, in the open dialog box, you can select a, a, a large number of of uh, file formats, okay. So you can actually bring uh, from different uh, other packages and bring them into SolidWorks. So that is uh, really uh, the, 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 our import capabilities is SolidWorks import capabilities as far as geometry goes. Okay. And that obviously goes to uh, to. Uh, you know, to AutoCAD, the, 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 the DXF and DWG files. Yeah, so we can we can import those as well. Uh, okay, the last module. And yes, uh, 
uh, excellent question. When we run this model, I presume you're referring to the to the voltage to high power lines. Uh, we have we have a surrounding air. So typically, what we do uh, we do we hide the air part, okay, which is here after air. Okay, so I can just you know show component. So you can see that we we put this in an air box. And this is, a, this is important because electromagnetic fields, unlike mechanical simulation where you're just limited to the, to the solids and the bodies, and, okay, uh, in, in this case electromagnetic fields exist in the surrounding, and what's surrounding these materials uh, is usually air. So unless you're doing a closed structure or whatever, uh, in this case we need to simulate to incorporate a certain section of uh, of the surrounding air, and you can see it in this case. That's the box that we put around this, and we put symmetry. Use the symmetry uh, for this model here to reduce the size of the problem. Okay. So I can actually maybe I can, uh, is the, uh, show you about this mesh. If, so once the body, once that part is visible, visible, then if I show the mesh, okay, then you can see how the mesh transitions from very fine because this is where we have the very very rapid field variation to very coarse as we go away from that model. Again, this is part of our uh, uh, measure. It will actually uh, do nice transition meshing. This way we optimize the use of resources, of the pure resources. We don't need an excessively fine mesh where it's not needed, uh, but we do have to have a fine mesh close to the to the conductors where the high voltage is applied, and you can see a, a good way of meshing in this in this case. Again, uh, we give you those mesh controls so that you can do this, and uh, ultimately when we'll have the uh, the adaptive meshing in there, uh, the adaptive mesher will help you if you start to do something like this, and if uh, or start with something slightly coarser, it will converge to this type of mesh uh, ultimately for you. Okay, I think I mean we are past uh, in, uh, ten minutes past the hour dedicated for this webinar. Uh, if there is no more questions, uh, there is one more question, I believe. Uh, well, there, there was one last point raised about validation of the, the program. I think uh, when users, you know, uh, either on a on a trial basis or when they purchase the software, uh, have a number of EMS tutorials. Uh, that, that are basic, basically uh, validation lessons and in each of those lessons there, is, uh, there, are, there are validation examples uh, that, that show you, uh, you know, how the software compares either usually to measurements or uh, to uh, some other published results in the letter. So you can see, uh, you can see this in the EMS tutorials. If you go to the, in this case, we're talking about the electrostatic, so you would consider these uh, electrostatic problems, EL234, uh, that have incorporated validation in them. You have additional lessons, just, you know, not necessarily validate against anything, but uh, equally useful for, uh, for uh, people to get started with the package. All right, I think. Uh, All right, I think. I mean, uh, I don't see any more questions, so I uh, just uh, wanted to uh, thank everybody for attending. Thank you all, gentlemen, and uh, you all have a great afternoon. And uh, please stay tuned uh, because you're going to have some more webinars coming up. Uh, the next one will be in two weeks from now. Uh, we do have uh, another webinar coming on Tuesday at 2 p.m. It's going to be about the Asia Fox, the high frequency electromagnetic simulator. Uh, but uh, please, uh, I mean, I will keep you updated and uh, please uh, stay, stay connected with us. It's been a pleasure having this webinar with everybody and have a great day.